Underground Bunker. This is your proprietor. Friday afternoon. End of a very busy week at the bunker. And what a capper today, huh? Found out yesterday. I'm very grateful from a great source that Jane Kember passed away on Wednesday at the age of 85. Had to scramble yesterday and get as much information about her as I could. Short time. Managed to find she had a very interesting birth name that I, I hadn't seen anywhere else. Um, again, thanks to our source checking uh, records over there in England. But, uh, you know, she's a huge figure in Scientology. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this morning at TonyOrtega.substack.com, where we put all the fresh reporting, I broke a story this morning that Jane Kember, the former spy master of the Church of Scientology's Guardian's office, died at the age of 85. Now, in the 70s, she was a huge figure in Scientology. She was essentially the third highest person in the entire organization under L. Ron Hubbard and his wife, Mary Sue. Uh, in 1966, um, Hubbard had created the uh, position of guardian. Initially, his wife was the guardian, but in 1969, according to John Atack, uh, Hubbard put Jane Kember in that role. Very interesting woman, originally from Kenya, and if you see some film from, from BBC interviews of her in the past, you, you see her inner her accent is a little different. Um, she was just known for making men quake in their boots. I mean, she ran an international spy network. Ruthless. I mean, she and Mary Sue were just determined to root out and destroy everyone they considered an enemy of Scientology. And in 1973, Hubbard was, L. Ron Hubbard was very frustrated because he was sailing, he was running Scientology from a ship, but they were running out of ports to go into because... Increasingly, governments were unfriendly to Scientology. And Hubbard figured it was because the U.S. and the English governments were spreading information about them, false information, you know, according to Hubbard's point of view. So in the spring of 1973, while he was temporarily hiding out in Queens, New York, Hubbard sat down and wrote out a program. He called it the Snow White Program. Press calls it Operation Snow White, but in Scientology, it was always the Snow White program. And in that program, he listed all these different countries where he wanted his operatives to get a hold of any documents they had about him so he would know what they were up against. And yes, the Freedom of Information Act was fairly new then, and he was encouraging them to use that. But he also, I found in that document, said that they should get these documents by any means necessary. And Mary Sue and Jane Kember took that very seriously. It started out kind of slow, but by 1974, Mary Sue and Jane Kember were encouraging these Guardian's office operatives to infiltrate government offices, get jobs there, burglarize offices. And back then, you have to understand, these operatives were all young, idealistic Scientologists. Today, they tend to hire outside contractors for their dirty work. But in the 70s, they were just really idealistic young Scientologists who believed that they were doing the right thing. Even today, when I was researching all this for my book about Paula Cooper, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, of course, I was trying to find some of these people today who were spies back then who broke into offices. And the few people I was able to locate, they really hadn't changed their point of view all that much. They really thought they were doing the right thing. But that's what happens when you buy into Scientology's, you know, point of view. It's us against the rest of the world. And it was Jane Kember who was calling the shots and dreaming up these operations and signing off on them and then giving out commendations when they had, you know, just destroyed somebody. She was, I mean, when they brought, finally brought these people to court, they just had, the government had just boxes and boxes and boxes of, of evidence showing that they had done this. But of course, Scientology, you know how it operates in court. It just fought tooth and nail. You know, uh, Jane Kember was doing all this, running all this spying on the U.S. government from England, from East Grinstead at St. Hill Manor, you know, uh, Scientology's U.K. headquarters. 
So the you know the FBI, the Department of Justice, wanted to bring her over to the U.S. to face charges, and they fought and fought. But she they finally managed to get her extradited, had a trial. She was found guilty, and she faced two to six years in prison. Mary Sue Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard's wife, was another one who went to prison. In all, 11 Scientologists were convicted of conspiracy uh, for these years of infiltration of the U.S. government. And sometimes I get asked, you know, how is it possible that Scientology could be found, you know, the top Scientologists could be found guilty of all this, and it didn't seem to, you know, really affect Scientology all that much. And, you know, one of the things I tried to tell in my book that I think doesn't get told all that often is that as soon as the FBI raided Scientology in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. in July 1977, as soon as that raid happened, and they did it because one of the operatives switched sides, uh, Michael Meisner came over and, and provided information to the FBI. As soon as that raid was done and the government had 100,000 documents just laying out all these incredible operations to destroy people, Scientology went into court with its high price attorneys and started um, bombarding the courts with claims that the search was illegal. And so what happened was the court said, okay, we're going we're gonna to check this, you know, we're going to litigate these claims and told the FBI, you can't do anything with those documents. So I think for a year, the government couldn't do anything with all this evidence. And you have to remember, there was no internet then. So the stories that had showed up the day of the raid, within a few weeks, there's no news, right? And, and how are you going to look it up? I mean, you could, I guess, if you go down to the library, but how many people are going to do that? It was just a different world then. And Scientology not only had stopped them from going through the docu documents initially, they also cultivated columnists. Scientology sent all these um, mailings to political columnists around the country characterizing this as the government coming down on a church. How, you know, unconstitutional is that? And some of the columnists bought it. I did a story about this, that conservative and liberal columnists in newspapers around the country were like, why is the government picking on a church? Incredible. Scientology, it's amazing. And, you know, they just never, never give up. Finally, the courts uh, dismissed Scientology's claims, and the FBI and the Department of Justice were allowed to go through those documents. And then in like April 78, almost a year after the raid, the public started finally hearing about what was in those documents. I think it was the Washington Post that wrote some of the first stories in April 78. So between 78 and 79 and 80, then there were a lot of stories about Paulette Cooper, Gabe Cazares, all this stuff going on down in Clearwater. Just amazing how this, this church was operating like you know, the Gestapo, like, you know, the East German police. And uh, and that, you know, was on the news pages for a while. But but back then, Scientology knew that if they just waited, it would, it would tamp down again. And so by the time the verdicts came in and the sentencing came in, it was like page 14. It wasn't page one anymore. Scientology knew that. And so that's how they weathered this storm, is that by the time Mary Sue Hubbard and Jane Kember went to prison, it just wasn't a big story anymore. Now, I think in the days of the internet, it would be a lot different, wouldn't it? Look how much attention the Underground Bunker and other news organizations pay to something like the Danny Masterson trial, and even some smaller ones, like, you know, I mean, not smaller, but like the trafficking lawsuit in Florida is not a smaller lawsuit, but there's nobody famous involved, but there's still lots of good coverage of it. And it persists because of the internet, and we're covering that all the time. And that's that's really been Scientology's nightmare in the last 20 years, is the way the internet covers its controversies is much more persistent, and, 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 and people can get it anytime, anywhere. It doesn't have to be on the front page of a newspaper. So that's a little bit about how Snow White didn't produce an even bigger effect on Scientology but uh, Jane Camber, wow, she was the top. She was the spy master. She was, like I said, she made men quake in their boots.
What an interesting person, and she never gave up Scientology. My source, I asked her yesterday that she knew the family really, really well. I said, was Jane into Scientology to her last day? And she said, absolutely, 100%. Wow. And uh, just before she died, her son had died. Um, I would say the two probably have something to do with each other. And I, and I indicated what the source said about Peter, her son, not taking medicine because he was a Scientologist. He was an indie. He was an independent Scientologist. He was posting over at ESMB, but he just did not want to take his medicine. So he had a heart attack. That's how it works. Well, what a day. And I see other people are picking it up. Other people are talking about it. Uh, once again, I really thank you for your, your reactions. And again, if you're just seeing this on YouTube, you don't know what we're talking about. TonyOrtega.substack.com. Sign up for the free emails there. You'll see these stories we're talking about. Okay? Got a lot more coming up. All right. This is your proprietor, somewhere in New York, signing off.